it's safe to say that these days, we know what stress feels like. We've all got those things in the back of our minds, periodically making our heart race, making our stomach drop, making us a little sweaty, just making us a bit stressed. But chances are the thing that is stressing you out is not a saber-toothed tiger or a cave bear or any one of these creatures up here. But as far as your body is concerned, this is it. This is stress. This is your interview. This is your exam. This is meeting your in-laws for the first time. These are the monsters that our body knows how to face, thanks to millions of years of evolution. Because for most of the history of our species, if we were stressed or afraid, it was because our body was in danger and we needed to deal with that quickly and effectively. Now, luckily for our ancient ancestors and for us, our bodies are hardwired for survival. When ancient humans encountered a giant cave bear, their bodies immediately began prepping to either fight it or flee from it, activating, you guessed it, the fight or flight response. But whether fighting or fleeing, the body was about to experience a huge increase in activity. Think about racing in a 10K or competing in a wrestling match. It is exhausting. Your muscles are working so hard, burning a huge amount of energy really quickly. So it's beneficial to prepare for that. And that's exactly what your fight or flight response does. When you sense any sort of danger, whether that's hearing a saber-toothed tiger or seeing a, a knife-wielding attacker, there is a huge shift in the performance of your entire body, starting in this tiny region in the center of your brain called the hypothalamus. This is your control center for your fight or flight response, ensuring your survival in any threatening situation. Your hypothalamus activates part of your nervous system called the sympathetic nervous system, which directly controls a huge number of organs throughout your body, coordinating incredibly fast responses that get you ready to go. Your breathing quickens to get more oxygen into your blood. Your heart beats faster and harder to deliver that oxygen and nutrients to your muscles, which can then make and use energy faster. Even your digestive system gets shut down so that those resources can be directed where they're needed most. All of these responses happen in seconds to get you amped up and ready for the fight of your life. And all of this works beautifully when your fight or flight response helps you get ready to fight or flee from the monsters around you. Those tigers, those attackers, arguably that really big spider in your shower. But these days, most of the monsters that we face are ones that live in our head. They pop up when you realize you're gonna be late for your flight or when you get that email from your boss asking if you have a minute or when you're standing up in front of a huge number of people talking at TEDx. <laughs> my heart right now is pounding out of my chest, but that's not particularly helpful in facing this monster, right? These things that aren't direct threats to our survival, I hope, can make us feel like they are. And that's because human life has changed a lot since the days of our ancestors. We went pretty quickly from living in small groups where predators and other animals were a major concern to these massive sprawling civilizations where our worries are typically more along the lines of, crap, I didn't respond to that email. When we were safer from things like predators, our day-to-day -day fears shifted towards things a little more existential. For instance, ancient Romans were generally more afraid of evil spirits and far-off groups of potential invaders than they were wolves and bears. So many of these monsters just moved right into our heads, but we didn't evolve a whole new response system for these modern stresses, as nice as that would have been. So as a diligent high school and then college student hell-bent on going to medical school, I can still remember the feeling of my heart racing not being able to catch my breath and being so nauseous, I wanted to throw up every time I walked into an exam. My body was convinced that taking that test was equivalent to fighting a bear. But if that was it, if it was just an increased heart rate and some nausea, we could deal with that, right? Just 
Don't eat those cookies before that medical school interview or that first date. Unfortunately, our fight or flight response affects our entire body in both the short and long term. While we're aware of some of these more noticeable changes, there are also some things happening that are a little more subtle going on behind the scenes in the brain. Just as we see huge changes to the structure and organization of life from our ancient ancestors to now, there are also changes to the structure and organization of the brain for us as a species, particularly in this outer region here called the cerebral cortex. This is one of the major regions of the brain that makes you you, where higher order thinking happens. This is where you hear and recognize your parents' voices, where you remember your best friend's coffee order, and where some other thoughts live, like that time that your server said, enjoy your meal, and you said, you too. Our big, beautiful brains are able to consider not only our immediate environment, but also every possible environment and every possible outcome to every hypothetical situation. It's what they do at 2 a.m. when you just want them to shut up so you can go to sleep. But every minute, there is so much for our poor brains to compute. How do they know what's important? Imagine this, you're standing in line at a coffee shop trying to remember your new friend's coffee order. Half-calf, extra foam, soy chai, latte. It's a good thing you like her. And suddenly, out of the corner of your eye, you spot a saber-toothed tiger staring you down. How well do you think you're going to do at saying that coffee order? Probably not very well, because there's something a lot more important going on. Survival. Seeing that saber-toothed tiger triggers your fight-or-flight response, which not only jacks up your heart rate, it also shuts down a number of regions in your brain in your cerebral cortex, including this region right up here at the front called the prefrontal cortex. This means that you're not going to be able to regulate your thoughts, your actions, and your emotions when you're stressed or scared. You hear about people in really extreme situations, like car accidents, say, I didn't even think, I just acted, it was all instinct. That's because deeper regions in the brain, literally located deeper inside the brain, take over when your fight or flight response is activated, resulting in your feelings and your deep-rooted experiences calling all the shots. This reset to factory settings, quieting the complexity of the cortex, was really useful for our ancestors because it ensured that they could take advantage of those quick responses, those instincts, rather than being slowed down by planning processes or distracted by prehistoric coffee orders. Now, fast forward to today, and our response to stress is the same, not just in our heart and in our stomach, but also in our brain. So as an undergrad, when I sat down to finally write my medical school applications, my fight or flight response just lit right up. My prefrontal cortex shut down and I couldn't come up with a coherent thought. The same thing happens to a lot of us when we go into a really tough exam or a big interview or when our date asks us what we like to do with our spare time. Our mind just goes blank. Your ability to perform tasks that require higher order thinking are greatly reduced when you're stressed or scared. And that creates a pretty big problem when the thing that is stressing you out requires higher order thinking, like acing that exam or getting that job or sounding breezy and confident on your date. Our response to stress is this dance between the threat and various different parts of our body where the threat is really taking the lead. But by recognizing the steps, we can take control of that rhythm and give ourselves the best chance of survival against these modern monsters. But how do we do that? How do we take control of that rhythm? Luckily, to go along with the amp you up, get you ready, shut down your brain, fight or flight response, you have an opposing system. A sit on the sofa, enjoy a glass of wine, rest and digest system which is regulated by a similar part of the nervous system called the parasympathetic nervous system. This part of your body is activated when you're at rest and at ease, and it does the opposite of just about everything the fight or flight response does. It decreases your heart rate, it helps calm your breathing, and it stimulates your digestion. 
your body's state at any given moment is a balance between these two systems. So when facing these modern monsters, it's really beneficial to boost up your rest and digest, which will dampen your fight or flight. Your prefrontal cortex is then free to do its job, to think, to think deeply and critically and logically all of these things that it's evolved so beautifully to do over hundreds of millions of years. Now, bumping up your rest and digest response is actually pretty easy. You already know how to do it. When you're panicking and freaking out, the first thing someone says to do is to stop. Take a deep breath. They're not just trying to shut you up. There's also a very good physiological reason for it. Remember that your fight or flight response is all about amping you up. And that includes taking those deep, quick, quick breaths to get that oxygen into your blood. But taking slow, intentional, and deep breaths gets oxygen into your blood really efficiently. So from the perspective of your nervous system, job's done. Check. You're ready. This increase in oxygen triggers your body to stop your fight or flight and activate your rest and digest. Prefrontal cortex comes back into play and you're ready to rock that interview. But as many of us can attest to, particularly my four-year-old when she does not want to relax and go to sleep, taking those deep breaths doesn't always feel like it's helping, right? So how do we know when it's working? We actually have a readout. Both of these systems affect your entire body at once, including your heart rate. Activating your fight or flight increases your heart rate. Activating your rest and digest decreases your heart rate. Focusing in on that decrease in your heart rate as you take those slow, deep breaths, activating your rest and digest response can subsequently make you feel more relaxed, more in control. This is part of a phenomenon called heart rate variability biofeedback, using your body's own feedback to reinforce these responses. This has been shown in a number of studies to help control stress and even ease symptoms of depression and anxiety. Now, this is often done in a clinic as part of a larger, more complex study, but you can do an at-home version before your next big interview by either self-monitoring or thanks 21st century, you can use your smartwatch to track your heart rate. Either way, you have this amazing inbuilt physiological magic trick to help you control your fight or flight and get you ready for that next challenge, ready to face that next monster. But then what? Being ready is incredibly useful, but taking control of that rhythm doesn't have to stop when you face that monster. After you get through that big exam or that medical school interview or that big presentation, what then? Let's say we succeed. Wonderful, we love that, right? And so do our brains. They flood with reward signals like dopamine and serotonin, making us feel happy and successful. And that's my story, right? I controlled my fight or flight. I defeated my medical school monster. I got all the dopamine. Nope because being ready is incredibly helpful, but it doesn't guarantee success. Sometimes we're going to fail, and that time I did. And when we fail, our body reactivates our fight or flight response. Our heart races, our prefrontal cortex gets shut down, our body floods with the stress hormone cortisol, and we feel scientifically crappy. What's more, our primal brain fixates on that failure. And then we can't stop thinking about that conflict or that mistake or that misstep. Now, this obsession was important for our ancestors because it helped them hone those instinctive reactions. It ensured that they didn't go back to that cave bear's cave or eat that poisonous plant again. But what about us? What about now? Keeping with our theme here, what worked great for our ancestors is not always what's best for us, particularly when you just want to stop thinking about that time that you accidentally spit a little bit on your coworker when you laughed at their joke. <laughs> but breaking free from that cycle, clearing your mind from the control of your fight or flight can be tough. Physiologically, we need to take back control of our prefrontal cortex. This is your center for learning and problem solving. 
So we need to make it do its job. Rather than letting our primal brain fixate on that failure, we can shift our perspective toward more prefrontal cortex-driven, reward-based learning, treating that failure like a problem to solve rather than a single terrible experience. We can focus on things like, what did I do well? What can I learn and take forward to be successful in the future? What is my next step? Changing this perspective can actually change the physiological way that our brain responds to failure. Rather than initiating the release of that punishing cortisol, it can lead to the release of rewarding dopamine, allowing us to perceive this as a more positive learning experience. This lets us fight back against that primal reaction, giving us some control and clarity. Following some of my biggest failures, that control allowed me to take a step back, get some perspective, and evaluate the path I was on. I ended up pursuing a career in the science behind the medicine, the thing that I was excited about in the first place. And now every day is full of the things that I love, like molecular interactions and gene delivery. But just because we learn from those failures and we learn how to approach them, that doesn't mean that it's going to be nonstop success, no more fight or flight. We're going to continue to face challenges and we're going to continue to experience failure as well as success. But at a point, those little failures just aren't that big of a deal anymore. The unknown is gone. We know we'll survive and we can use our prefrontal cortex to control our fight or flight response both before and after facing those modern monsters. Didn't get that funding? I'll ask for feedback and I'll reapply. Surviving but not thriving at my job? I'll put myself out there and I'll try. Gotta go through some tough IVF to start a family? Bring it on. Now some of those things went according to plan and others didn't, but I ended up with a life that I love and little monsters in my head that I am grateful for because life is exciting and challenging and short. Take a deep breath and dive in. Pack in that failure because it's not that scary. You just have to tell your body that. Thank you.